All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dimash Lektenka. I'm the director of uh, IPAM, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics on campus. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have a, a wonderful public lecture for you today. I uh, just wanted to say a few words about IPAM and why this lecture is here. Um, IPAM is an NSF-funded math institute uh, whose purpose is to bring top research scientists from around the world working on mathematics and disciplines related to mathematics. So we run long programs as well as short workshops and uh, other activities. And right now we're in the middle of two other activities. One is our RIPS, of Research Industrial Projects, uh, for undergraduate students, this uh, is where teams of undergrads come here from all over the United States, in fact, all over the world, to work on projects that are um, presented by industry. And uh, they are going to be spending the rest of the summer with us. They just started a couple of days ago. Uh, we also, at the same time, are running a graduate summer school in something called Mean Field Games, which is a subject somewhat related to um, the subject of the talk uh, here. And one of the speakers at the Meanfield Games uh, workshop is Jan, Jan Brunier. So uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a great pleasure to have uh, uh, such a large group of, of undergraduate and graduate students as well as other junior mathematicians here on the UCLA campus. So let me introduce Stan Osher. He's the director of our special projects. And his special project for tonight is to introduce Jan Brunier. <laughs> well, it's hard to introduce such an unpretentious, nice person with a pompous introduction, but I'll do it. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Jan Brenier. Uh, he's the Director of Research at CNRS in Palaiso in France. Uh, but I can begin by this quote from a book by Cedric Villani, who won the Fields Medal a while ago. Uh, in 1781, Gaspard Mange defined the problem of optimal transport in engineering. 1942, which is a great year, I was born then. <laughs> Uh, Leonid Kantorovich used a linear program to, programming, sorry, to uh, solve the problem and, uh, or try to solve the problem in, uh, in, with applications in economics. And uh, in 1987, Jan Brenier used optimal transportation to prove a new projecting theorem on a set of measured valued prop, uh, functions in fluid, using fluid dynamics, which is typical of his crazy originality. Well, what does fluid dynamics have to do with this stuff? It's mind-boggling. He took a very complicated nonlinear uh, equation and made it much, much simpler and accessible. And uh, Villani goes on, each of these contributions marked the beginning of a whole mathematical theory with many unexpected ramifications. That's not bad. <laughs> so one of the ramifications is that he's here. Uh, I met Jan in 1983 in Mexico, of all places when he was driving a monster car in the streets of Mexico City. Uh, were you in the French Army or something, uh, Peace Corps, whatever it was? Uh, he spent four quarters at UCLA after that in the 80s, and he did crazy original, uh, extremely original work always. Uh, I got interested in the insane stuff he was doing in conservation laws, uh, where he used multi-valued solutions and averaged them, and that was totally original. And then, of course, Benamou Branier, uh, and he has a beautiful result about convergence of approximations uh, of a, uh, a row scheme, which, uh, can, which gives you existence, a new existence theorem for conservation laws, which he never published. Uh, my favorite title is Reconstruction of the Early Universe, which makes it a little less pompous, I mean, a little more pompous there. <laughs> uh, and then a paper on sticky particles, which sounds intriguing. Uh, there was a Brenier number where you divide his accomplishments by his pretentiousness, and, and you get essentially plus infinity. Uh, he is truly original in every way, and he's a good lecturer, as you will see. OK, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, OK, OK, OK. Okay, yeah, Stan, thanks a lot for the beautiful, I mean, the wonderful introduction. And uh, so I would like to, to thank all the people who have been uh, involved in the, 
in this event. And uh, I, am, I would say I am very grateful to UCLA and to Stan Osher because, you know, I have been here for many, many times. And this was really a key point, I mean, a, a turning point for my career. So I am still uh, quite in love with UCLA and, uh, and California, actually. And so it's very emotional for, for, for me to be here after, like, I think, um, as you said, 35 years. 83. This was the summer of 83, actually. Uh, I, I visited uh, uh, Stan Osher, actually in San Diego. So this was my first. And believe me, I did a trip from Mexico City to San Diego by ground transportation. So I took the train to Mexicali, and then a bus from Mexicali to Tijuana. And then I crossed the border like a charm. I mean, it was very easy. I just walked along the street, essentially. So, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, also I, I just had a, a coffee at Kirchhoff, which is really also emotional because it's uh, maybe, maybe one of the, the central part of, uh, maybe of UCLA, at least the southern campus part of And uh, so it's really great to be here again. Okay, so today I uh, would like to uh, make a connection between the fluids and combinatorics which seems to be a silly project because combinatorics is about uh, discrete things and fluids is completely, it's continuum mechanics. So this is flowing and it is not discrete in any way. However, there is a link and uh, uh, quite surprisingly, uh, I thought this idea to be, uh, is it okay because the, the sound is okay? I found this idea very original until I learned from a, a, a colleague from the Czech Republic that there was this concept of the melting Rubik's Cube. So I don't know how much you are familiar with this program, this TV program. Okay, of course, this is as pompous as the early universe. It's more or less the same. Okay, so I should, we should have changed the title. Okay, and then maybe you know this, this, uh, this guy. This, yeah. And so I, I think you can see the melting Rubik's Cube, but if you don't see it very well, uh, this is a better picture. And then you have the combination of combinatorics and fluid. So it's perfect. So uh, my talk will be devoted uh, to the relationship between uh, combinatorics. So by combinatorics, I mean also permutation of, of cubes. So the Rubik Cube is, uh, you know, you have some, uh, a lot of permutations are not permitted. So it's a kind of partial uh, subgroup of the group of permutation. And of course, I will use the full group of permutation. So, uh, the, so the outline of the talk, there will be a little bit of historical part, which is related to the, to the wonderful uh, person of uh, Leonard Euler. So I think we should uh, talk a little bit about him. And then uh, I will uh, move to a, a key point to understand the link between fluid and combinatorics, which was the geometric interpretation of the Euler equation. So there is a, a little touch of geometry in my talk. And uh, after that, we will see how it is quite natural to discuss a concept of discrete fluid and uh, eventually, I will show you the relationship with the, the theory of optimal transport, which has been quite successful in the last 20 years. And uh, in this theory, in some sense, there is a nice blend between the concept of convexity, which is really uh, very much related to the world of continue, continuous objects, and the uh, combinatorics. So this is the outline of the talk. And uh, let me start by uh, the, the work that Euler did in the 18th century. And uh, of course, there had been some work on fluid mechanics before Euler. And in particular, the people like uh, Bernoulli, who was the, I mean, there were several Bernoulli, and one of them was the advisor of, uh, of Euler. So, there was a tradition, and uh, 
Surprisingly, this took place in the Swiss city of Basel. So you know there is a usual cliche about Switzerland that the Swiss have never invented anything but the clock watch, which is, which is completely unfair. So I don't know if there is any Swiss citizen here. OK? But this is, uh, the, at least, I mean, they had Euler. And Euler was a citizen from Basel in Switzerland. And uh, probably one of the very best mathematicians ever. So I don't know, depending on the people, it could be ranked one or two or three. Maybe not more than that. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, that what is not so much really said about the Euler theory of fluids, that in some sense, this was a very, the very first field theory, in the sense that you describe physics in terms of fields and PDEs. And I don't think, because even Newtonian gravitation is not really like that. So uh, this was really the, the, in my opinion, the first field theory. And this was followed uh, later on by uh, Maxwell, which is one century later almost. And of course, Einstein, Schrodinger, and Dirac. But in some sense, you can say that Euler set up the uh, very uh, first uh, field theory. And in addition, it was a nonlinear theory which is not even true for Maxwell and Schrodinger. And Dirac, these are linear equations. So only Einstein equation is really a nonlinear field theory after Euler. And actually, some men in the PD community, some people are fond of both uh, Euler and uh, Einstein equation. Of course, Einstein equation is much more complicated. But Euler equations are very challenging and very interesting for PD people, anyway. So just to show you the, some uh, cliché about uh, Euler. Uh, so of course, there is this nice formula, e to the i pi plus 1 equal to 0, because it seems that uh, the, the, the notation e, i, and pi are, entirely, are, are due to Euler himself. So introduce this notation. And of course, he used the, uh, the imaginary, the exponential of the imaginary number. And then the, OK, some years ago, the Swiss, they had a 10 franc banknote with uh, Euler, which is here. Unfortunately, Euler has disappeared from the, the banknotes. This, the same is true in Germany for Gauss. You know, the Deutsche Mark, there was a, a, a Deutsche Mark banknote with uh, Gauss, but they, they, it disappeared. So we should worry about that. OK, <laughs> so we should do something about that, maybe. Uh, uh, Stan could be featured in the new banknote of California. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then there is a stamp. So, yes, and there is a stamp which is uh, from Switzerland. Okay, so now let me move to the, to the original uh, Euler equation. So on purpose, of course, I took a paper written in French. And actually, at that time, you know, Euler was working for the Berlin Academy of Science under the rule of the king, Frederick II. And Frederick II uh, had decided, he was a Prussian, but he had decided that French would be the official language of the academy. And he explained that there is something fishy about the German language, and it is not yet ready. And this was pretty good, because actually, uh, German language became a major science language uh, one century later. OK, so in some sense, the, it was for practical purpose. There was no ideology. But he, at that time, he thought that French was the better language uh, possible for this kind of thing. And so the, the, the Euler equation are written here. And you can see that they are almost written in the same way as we could do now. So uh, uh, Euler was also a kind of na uh, notational genius in the sense that he was introducing very clear notation. And uh, so you can see that the notation are still used. So t for the time, x, y, z for the space, u, v, w for the velocity, no change, p for the pressure. Everything is, comes from Euler. The only slight. Uh, this difference is Euler was using Q for the density, and now we are more often using the letter rho, the Greek letter rho. But Q and rho are not so different, actually. Okay. 
And then also, you see that uh, Euler was very careful because it could be QR on the left hand side. So which means that you can, you can do anything because it depends, you have to define what is P, Q, and R. So these are the forcing term. This is telling you about the acceleration of fluid particles. And uh, there is one key uh, factor, which is the P, which is the pressure. So in some sense, the concept of pressure was nicely understood by uh, Euler. In, of course, in spite of the fact that pressure was already existing in earlier, uh, earlier work, but in some sense, this is the first the first paper where the pressure features in a very clear way, and the PQR are just the forcing term that are accelerating the fluid. So it could be the, the fact that the fluid is uh, moved by the, the wind, or could be moved by uh, the Coriolis force, or any forcing term. And this is included in PQR. And there is also the famous continuity equation that we can see in the top. And uh, you can also see that uh, in his paper, Euler was considering uh, both the case of compressible fluids, the, like the, the air, or incompressible fluid, which don't exist in nature because every fluid is compressible, but water is very, very, I mean, has a very, it's very hard to compress water, and it is a very good approximation that to consider that fluid is incompressible. The water is an incompressible fluid at our scale, at least. And uh, in the following of my talk, I will concentrate only on the incompressible situation. But don't forget that Euler did a theory for both compressible and incompressible free. OK, so, okay, so uh, the, the Euler equation are still very important in practice because they, they lie at the heart of any weather forecast uh, simulation. So if you have some good idea about the forecast, of the weather forecast, it's largely part due to Euler, but of course there is a lot of additional modeling. And uh, if I go back to the previous uh, slides, every, you know, the, all the physics in atmospheric and ocean science is really contained in PQR. And this is a mess. To understand. But however, people are doing very good weather prediction now, thanks to very good numerical schemes. And of course, uh, UCLA had been at the front line of, of designing uh, efficient numerical scheme for fluids. And uh, so this is what I just said. So the, uh, it is quite interesting also to see that Euler was uh, conscious about the difficulty of his model because he wrote, so again, in, 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 uh, uh, because the Euler equation are very difficult PDEs and there are not so many uh, results available. So in some sense, in the two-dimensional case, where you have only two space dimension, which is pretty good because for atmospheric and oceanic science, you can consider the fluid is almost two-dimensional because the thickness at large scale, the thickness of the ocean and the atmosphere is very, very small. So, but in the full three-dimensional situation, the Euler equation are basically not understood. And this has been the case for 250 years and even more now. Okay, so uh, you may know also that if you add some viscosity, some uh, dissipation mechanism to the Euler equation, you get the famous Navier-Stokes equation, which has been uh, retained as one of the challenging problems in mathematics by the, the Clay uh, Foundation. And, uh, but some people like uh, Euler equation as well. And of course, the Navier-Stokes equation are very much related to one of the big mystery of physics, which is the understanding of the, the hydrodynamic turbulence. And uh, I think there are many jokes about that. I, I don't remember. I mean, the, probably a famous physicist. Uh, there is the, so it's, if, I'm not sure about who said that, but this is a, a scientist uh, in heaven, and uh, he's allowed to ask questions to God. So the first question is, what's the general equation of the universe? And God say, goes to the blackboard and says, it's very easy. Let me write down the equation. And then the second question is, 
uh, what about turbulence theory? And then, oh no, this I, uh, I gave up. It's too difficult for me. So turbulence is a mess, and this is supposed to be part of statistical mechanics, but the knowledge of statistical mechanics is far beyond what is needed to understand turbulence. So it is a really active field in theoretical physics and some part of mathematics. OK, so the final conclusion, which is sorry, it's re also written in French. And uh, actually, the, 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 the text is very, is, is very nice to read in French, actually, because it's very good. The, the quality of the French language is much higher than what we are doing now. <laughs> OK? And uh, he said that, OK, what he tried to do is to, to write the equation uh, properly to have a nice model. So this was like a modeling paper, a paper of modeling. And he said, of course, the analysis is too hard to do, and uh, I, I will leave that for future research. Of course, at that time, analysis was a little bit uh, not so clearly defined concept. Analysis was also the way of getting explicit solution. So it is not really analysis in the modern sense. But it is very funny that Euler already expected that the difficulty of the analysis of the Euler equation would be extremely high, which has been confirmed. OK, so now let me switch to the second part of the, of the talk. So, uh, which is the relationship of, between the Euler equation and geometry. So, uh, that's quite fascinating because it's what it is, you know, PDE are more or less describing things in infinite dimension. Because the, this is like uh, evolution equation for fields. And fields have uh, infinite degrees of freedom, so they are like infinite dimensional manifold in some sense. And it turns out that the Euler equation is maybe one of the simplest possible geometric objects in infinite dimension. And this has been worked out by the, the uh, Vladimir Arnold, who is now, I mean, who, yeah, who died uh, uh, eight years ago. Actually, it, actually, it's quite sad. I think he died the very week of the International Congress of Mathematics. I think. Yes, if I am not mistaken. Together with Maliavin, I think, the same week. OK, and uh, the, the, this, the interpretation is, at least for incompressible fluids, you can see the, an incompressible fluid in a, in a vessel, in a, in a bounded domain, as a succession, like a movie, where what is moving is a volume-preserving map. Because incompressibility means that the, the particle can, can move around, but the elementary volume of each, if each pitch of fluid should keep the same volume. And therefore, you can see that as a kind of sub-manifold of the set of all maps. So the maps that are preserving the volume. So I will show you a picture in a moment. And then, so it's, in some sense, you could see this, uh, this manifold like a, like a sphere in the Euclidean space. So it's a kind of a restricted part of the, of the space. And therefore, you can think in terms of uh, geometric terms as like looking at geodesics along this, uh, this, uh, this manifold. And it turns out that the Euler equation can be defined as the geodesic curves along this infinite dimensional manifold once you put the simplest possible metric in infinite dimension, which is the L2 metric. So if you know uh, uh, integration theory or Hilbert space, this is the simplest possible linear space you can think of, L2. And then you look at this subset, this, this, um, this manifold of volume-preserving map, and then you try to find geodesics along this path, this, uh, this manifold, and then this is the same as Euler equation. So this is a geometric definition of Euler equation. And uh, let me show you some. So this is a paper written. Oh, sorry, by chance, actually, Vladimir Arnold also wrote that in French in 1966. So sorry <laughs> about that. And he actually, for fun, he decided to write the paper in the, in the pure Bourbaki style. And he make a, a kind of joke about that in the paper. And actually, it's not so easy to read, because it is written in the style of uh, really uh, serious geometry, Riemannian geometry. And then, therefore, it's not so easy to read, actually, in practice, if you are not trained. And actually, there is a nice joke but if, about the, 
the Bobaki in the, in the, I don't know if you are familiar with this joke. I mean, he, he used a kind of a f wrong translation of the Russian to the French. So in some sense, the story is that there was a sentence of Bourbaki saying that we should uh, substitute for, for, uh, for brutal calculation some kind of uh, nice understanding of, uh, of, the, of the equation. Sorry, I, I'm not quoting that very properly. So this has been translated to Russian, apparently with a mistake, where they changed the order of the, the words. And then he translated that back to French. So in some sense, he reversed the order. So this is like, you know, I will follow the example of Bourbaki, and I, I will try to, to use, a, to use a brutal calculation instead of uh, intuitive pitch or something like that. So it was really funny. Because if you don't pay attention, you could believe that this was exactly what it was meaning. OK, sorry, my, my, my English is too limited to, to tell the story. But you can look at the introduction of the paper, and we will see the. Uh, this uh, joke, which is uh, okay. So uh, let me to back up a little bit. So if you have uh, in uh, in the 3D case, like the surface of the Earth uh, manifold like a sphere, then you everybody knows uh, the concept of geodesics because uh, we are supposed to fly, and so typically, flight are uh, following geodesics. So this is why to go to Los Angeles, I had to fly over Greenland, which is magnificent. OK? And because we follow geodesics. OK, now the, the second uh, picture I wanted to show to you is the, uh, what is the volume preserving map. So this is in the two space dimension. So let me put some grid on some uh, periodic square. And then you have two, three examples of maps that are distorting this grid. And you see that, I guess that you can guess who he is incompressible between these maps. And uh, you have any idea? So of course, this is the south uh, east corner, because you see that uh, the, the two other maps are really inflating some square and shrinking some square. But the final one, the south uh, west uh, map, it's southeast, sorry. I said southwest, southeast. I'm always confused by uh, west and east. So the southeast map. You know the Florida map, if you want, OK? Is really uh, volume preserving. So we are in 2D. Volume preserving in 2D means area preserving. OK, but it's harder to draw pictures in three, di in three dimension. OK, so in some sense, the, the, this concept of geodesics is you concentrate on maps of the, fir of, the, of the last type. And therefore, there is a really a constraint. So it is not a stupid, uh, it's not a stupid straight line. Uh, it's, like, it's a little bit like on the sphere. OK, so the, uh, now I'm switching, really, to, the, to uh, combinatorics. Because as I told you, and maybe it was a little bit suggested by the picture already. Because you know, I uh, divided the, the, the space in cells. And uh, the main, the main uh, property of the volume preserving map is to preserve the area of, the, of, the, of these uh, little cells. But now, if you are thinking in terms of TV, or you know, because I've been, I grew up at the time where TV was emerging, so then you, you are immediately thinking in terms of pixels. So everything is discrete on the TV screen. And you know that more and more, the reality is what you see on the TV set on your, on your computer. You know? So people will be more and more uh, uh, thinking in a discrete way, because everything is discrete, right, for computers and, uh, and things. So now, it's a natural idea to uh, use that as an approximation uh, trick. And uh, you remember, maybe, this a little bit old-fashioned, this old, uh, old, uh, old toy where you have to move uh, cells. You know? And this is like a permutation. So you divide the space in 16 cells. And what you can do is to do any permutation you want. Actually, it's not exactly true, because in the real game, you have to remove one, uh, one block. So it's not exactly true. But anyway, you have the idea that you can label the, the space by a discrete number of cells. And a volume preserving motion is just approximately a kind of succession of permutations. So if you think in a discrete way, so the, instead of a, of a fluid which is continuously evolving, you just have a very fast succession of permutation 
of a very, very, very fine grain, like a, a TV screen. I mean, the old-fashioned TV screen, at least. OK? So that's the basic idea uh, to make the link between uh, fluid and mechanics and, and, uh, and combinatorics. And of course, we go back to this idea of the melting Rubik's Cube, because this is really the compromise between uh, to be a fluid and to be a discrete object. OK, so now I'm going to play a little bit uh, some kind of uh, to try to see how I can solve the Euler equation in a discrete way. So I'm just playing with a discrete model. And to make things very simple, I consider that the, my uh, physical domain is so thin that I consider, I consider just one layer of cube. So instead of taking a square, I consider just one layer. But now, since I have the possibility of permutating the cubes, I don't care about the, this one dimensionality, because the, you know, the cube, they can, uh, they can flip over without trouble. So the, let me uh, do this exercise with uh, 12 uh, little cubes. They should be cubed. Uh, of course, they are stretched because of the, of the software. So we have 12 little cubes. And uh, let me try to, to just to, to play the game. So it is like playing with the Rubik's Cube. Uh, the, the, uh, the difference that the motion is much more flexible in this case, because I can do any permutation I want. So for instance, I can move forward by exchanging neighbors. So 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 3, 4, 2, 2 4, 3. OK? Uh, and then immediately you notice something, that if I do the same again, I will go back to the previous situation. So, so it's not so interesting. So I, I, know I, don't, I don't move, essentially. But if I, fix, if I fix the boundary terms, you know, I can do, uh, ah, yes, uh, I get something more interesting. So you know, I, 2 and 11 are fixed, but the other ones are exchanged, right? And I can do that again. Because now, I mean, I don't need to fix the boundary because I get a non-trivial thing by doing this. And uh, so I'm starting getting bored by that. So I make a now I make a mistake. So I said, well, this is too slow. And let, let me jump directly by two, two cubes. For instance, you see that the five is moving forward by two units this time. OK? So is it the same for everybody? Yeah, two is moving forward by two units, you see? So I try to speed up the motion. OK? I speed up the motion. We will see. And now I can continue. So I just, uh, I, mean, I think I can do. So now I, I think, yes. Yeah, OK, this step is a little bit like over speeding on the highway. So in some sense, you are bored by, you, I don't know, now it's 65, 50, 70? Or it's still 55? It's 75 now? No, 65. 65. OK, so this has been progressing. I mean, maybe it's wrong, but uh, my time was 55. So uh, you see that you are starting over speeding. Because you are bored, 65 you are bored, so you go to 100 mph. And then, of course, uh, the you are immediately watched by the helicopters or some fancy device, and then you slow down. So let me go back to the more uh, standard pace, and I think I will continue this way. Okay. So uh, also, it is interesting that if you, if you uh, tag one of these cubes, for instance, cube number four, you see that you see a kind of a motion that looks almost like a continuous motion, because the four is just moving to the left and then bouncing back on the, on the boundary and going to, to the right. So actually, you can already see that uh, even this discrete motion might be able to mimic some uh, kind of a more natural uh, motion uh, in continuous mechanics. OK, so now I have to You remember that in the model of Euler, there was a concept of geodesics. And geodesics means that you try to save uh, the, your energy. So you try to do the less costly possible motion. So that's the idea behind geodesics. And here, we are going to attach to every one of these uh, discrete motion a cost. So if you don't move, it costs nothing. But you don't reach, you don't get anything out of that. So now I am going to, to uh, introduce the concept of cost. And actually, in order to be consistent with the Euler equation 
And the concept of geodesics, actually more precisely of uh, uh, constant speed geodesics, the right thing to do is to consider that the cost of every motion is a square of the distance. Not the, the distance itself, the square of the distance. Very important. You know, <laughs> so you have really to care about the square. And therefore, you understand very well that the overspeeding is extremely costly. For instance, I put the, the, the cost is one unit when you move forward by one unit. Okay? And I do that space and time. And you see that for the, the, first, the first line, the first time, you spend 12 because every cube moved by one unit. The second one, since you have fixed the, the boundary cubes, you pay a little bit less, 10. But it's marginally left, uh, less. But now the overspeeding, so this is like a, I am a, like the police lecturing you. So the overspeeding costs you a lot, OK? 42, actually, because you have to square two, so it's four, and you, you add up. And if I'm not mistaken, the total number is 42. OK, and now, since after that you go to a more peaceful speed, uh, you get the total cost of 108, 108. And you see that most of the, of the price has been paid in this, just this stupid time where you have been overspeeding. OK. Yeah, this was what I mean. So now, uh, of course, uh, if you try to minimize the cost, this is a horrible combinatorial problem. And of course, if you use the most stupid method, which is to consider all possible permutation, then it's a gigantic number. So if I'm not mistaken, you get a t 10 to the 52. So uh, even with a very good computer, it is not affordable. So of course, you cannot find, even if it is very, very simple, very limited example, you cannot solve the problem just by considering all possibilities. You have to do some optimization in a, in a, in a reasonable way. So now there is a guess to get the, the, good, the best solution. And you will remember the lesson taught by the policeman that we shouldn't overspeed, but we should saturate, in some sense, the speed limit. Right? So that's a good uh, practice. So the, this is why you have uh, cruise control. Which I think, I mean, I must say that cruise control is a magnificent inv invention, which was probably done in the USA. Uh, and I, know, I don't think, yeah, I think it's. And this is like bowling. It's fantastic because you are really saving you know, energy by uh, bowling. It's, uh, it's really a fantastic invention because the ball goes back to you without effort. So it's much better than ping pong, uh, all these kind of games where it's exhausting to to get the, the ball back. So, so these are really incredible inventions, so bowling and cruise control. Okay. So here we are putting your cruise control on, and we see what's, what we get. So I went the wrong order. OK. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to do the exercise. And of course, uh, on the slide, you see that I am anticipating the idea that passing to the limit will probably lead me back to the Euler equation. So in some sense, I will get a com completely combinatorial interpretation of the Euler equation. OK. OK, so let me uh, try to uh, reach this uh, final permutation given to me, so I want just to flip over the, the cube. And actually, this problem is known in computer science. So unfortunately, I didn't mention, the, and there is no blackboard anyway. So uh, this has a name for people which are between combinatorics and computer science. And there is a name for this problem. And usually, this is a stochastic problem. So you want to know what is the, in some sense, the probability to go from the initial permutation to the final one by flipping neighbors. And there is a very distinguished uh, uh, mathematician. Uh, so I think there is at least, there should be at least one Hungarian citizen here. Right here? Yeah. OK. Or, uh, yeah. I mean, not, OK. I'm not entering into it. So it's not exactly Hungarian, but almost. 
Okay, and then uh, I think he's working in, to in, uh, in to Toronto. It's uh, um, Balint Virag. Or, I mean, in the Hungarian order, it would be Virag Balint, right? So, uh, and there, there is uh, some paper about that. And then, you, therefore, you try to see if you flip neighbors, in some sense, what is the probability, in some sense, to reach the, this final con configuration. Okay, so now I use the strategy I started with, that is just flipping uh, neighbors, and every uh, odd time step, I fix the boundary, the finite cube. So I do that, so I can, you, you, you've seen that already, and so, wow, oh, it's a little bit tough, and then it turns out that you get to the final configuration in a finite number of steps. Okay, so it is a little bit uh, boring as a, it's, but now, if we tag cube 4 and cube 5, then we see a pattern emerging. Because you see that two neighboring cubes, so clearly they, 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 use, they, they travel at the maximal speed. I mean, the maximal speed, which is, makes sense to save uh, energy. And then they bounce on the boundary, and you see that the two different, the two neighbors are splitting from each other, but at the end of the day, they, they, con they goes back to a neighboring position. So in some sense, if you think about passing to the limits, you have a funny phenomenon. That is, two neighboring points will follow two different trajectories. So you cannot pass to the limit in a conventional way. Because in a conventional way, if you are two neighbors, you pass to the limit, they should follow the same trajectory. It's not the case. And actually, the right way to do it is Okay, so you can see the pattern. So it looks a little bit like the Czech Republic. <laughs> okay, so the, the pattern is, is this one. So it means that, in some sense, you have to admit the idea that particle can split, and with probability one half, they go one direction or the other direction. So some people, I mean, including myself, call that generalized flow. That is, you have a probability measure, and the people who attended the lecture of Daniel Lacker last week, so this is also used in the in mean field game theory in optimization. This idea of uh, introducing some probability measure to describe uh, oscillatory phenomena. Okay, and so you can do that for every point, and then I have a candidate to be an optimal solution. So this should be related to the Euler equation in some sense, if it's correct. So you, you do that for every point, so it's a very simple strategy. And actually, for a while, I was convinced that that was the right solution. Unfortunately, it is not. Actually, or maybe fortunately, actually. And uh, you, can, uh, you can actually do better. You can save, in terms of cost, a factor. You can, uh, you can do 82% uh, of this cost. And the picture is this one. So that is, if you have two points, you, you know, it is not, uh, you don't have to split the point in two parts. You have to split in a continuous way. So here I draw only a finite number of trajectories, but actually it's a continuum of trajectory linking the two opposite points. And you have to do that for every point. So in some sense, if, if, I, would, if I would show the full picture, this would be a mess, because all this curve will be oscillatory, uh, will be overlapping. And uh, you can also see that these curves are actually sine function. I mean, they are trigonometric function. So there is actually a closed formula for this solution. And in some sense, you can show that this is the best solution. OK? And it works also at a numeric uh, uh, level. So for instance, with a crude discretization with 144 cubes and 16 time steps, you get something which is not very uh, accurate, but it picks up. The, the spirit or the exact solution. And actually, if you go a little bit further with 4,000 cubes and 16 steps, you get a rather good approximation of the theoretical results. And this you can do in a, it's very easy to do numerically. It doesn't cost anything. So this can be run very quickly in a few seconds on the computer. Because there are some tricks that maybe I will mention a little bit later. OK, so now if you look at all trajectories, it's a kind of uh, a messy picture. So maybe it looks a little bit like a storm. So in some sense, I did a computation in one space dimension 
But if, in a funny way, if you look at the space side trajectory, it is like looking at a, a horror movie where there is a big storm destroying your house or something like that. Okay. So this is not so much for California. I mean, it's maybe more for the Texas and the, and the southern coast than California itself. Okay, so now I, uh, I consider a different final permutation. So instead of exchanging the cube like this, what I do is a kind of uh, funny uh, final permutation. So you see I jump by two units until I reach 12, and then I go down to 2. And of course, I do that with many more particles. So this is in the case of uh, only 12 particles. So in some sense, the final, com the final uh, permutation is like expanding half of the unit interval to the whole uh, unit interval and to reverse this uh, once again. And then the funny thing is you see that this looks like a tornado now. Because actually these, uh, these particles, they move forward to invade the, the entire interval. So it looks more like a kind of what is called by, uh, in fluid mechanics, a potential flow. And uh, the, in the right hand side, you have to rotate the particle. So it looks like a tornado, like a vortex. So it's a vertical flow and a potential flow that are mixed together. So you see, it's, it looks much more and more like real fluid mechanics. OK, so now uh, I think this slide can be, so I just try to, so I, I think I can skip this a little bit. So this is like a mathematical formulation uh, of what we have done. So in some sense, we are looking for a sequence of permutation. And uh, we, have, we, are, the, we are moving the centers of the cells. And we are adding the square distance of all these guys. And we want to optimize that with all possible sequence of permutation. And in some sense, this is a, you can see this as a discrete version of the order equation. So of course, the notation is totally different from what we have said, seen before. But in some sense, in the spirit, this is encoding at the discrete level the order equation also, the incompressible order equation. So I don't insist on this slide because it's too messy. Too messy. So in some sense, if you are able to solve this, com com it's, of course, it's a combinatorial optimization problem because you have to find an optimal sequence of permutation. And therefore, it's, it is well known that most of the combinatorial optimization problems are very hard to resolve. So they are really challenging. Sometimes it is uh, almost impossible to solve them. But in some cases, you can solve them approximately. OK, so, the, so this is, uh, OK, so now there is a sub-problem which is much easier to tackle, is you assume, OK, this is a uh, numeric analysis. It's called the Gauss-Seidel type uh, method. So you assume that you know you have a guess for all permutation but one. And then you optimize with respect to what you said. So you get a simpler problem, which is written here. So don't care about the formula. OK, sorry, did I do it the wrong way? OK, yes. And uh, so I try to, to write it in a simpler way. So you are given a so-called cost function, Cij, which is the, the distance between two set of points, the Bi and the Aj. And you try to see the best assignment between the i and the j in order to, demi to, uh, to minimize the total cost. OK, so you have the choice of, and uh, in the application from the order equation, the bi are given by an explicit formula. And this problem is a nice combinatorial problem, actually. So in some sense, you have been able to divide the difficulty in a succession of simpler combinatorial problems. And of course, you need iteration, because uh, you, you know the decomposition in sub-problem is not enough. You have to iterate. And uh, yes, and so this is uh, the so-called uh, linear assignment problem in combinatorics. So you, if you look at a book in combinatorial optimization, you will find that in the first five pages. This is one of the most elementary problems in combinatorial optimization. 
And, uh, you know, in economical terms, it means that typically you have, uh, you have uh, some workers, I, to, and you have to assign uh, uh, jobs to, the, to each worker. So, for instance, if you have a company with uh, uh, one part in Los Angeles and one part in New York, you would hardly ask a guy from Los Angeles to bring the coffee to the people of New York. So this would be a bad idea, right? It would be very costly to do that. Okay, so this is a kind of practical problem you, you have to, to deal with. So it's very well known. This is the so-called uh, uh, the linear assignment problem. And actually, this has been understood very well, including the continuous limit, by uh, uh, Leonid Kantorovich, so another guy from uh, Russia. And this was done in 1942, as you mentioned, right? Uh, uh, and actually, surprisingly, this guy got the Nobel Prize in economics. So this was Soviet Union. You know, this guy was really doing the mathematics of plan of uh, planned economy. So, you know, and he got Nobel Prize in economics. So it's really strange. I mean, but this was in the 70s. So people had diff diff slightly different ideas at that time. Okay. So the and. The, technically speaking, uh, the trick of Kantorovich, which is a very well-known trick now, was to understand that this combinatorial problem can be put as a linear program, which is one of the simplest possible convex optimization problem. So uh, this is readily uh, bridging two different worlds, the world of convexity and the world of combinatorics. So in some sense, this was more or less understood at the time of Kantorovich. And uh, you know, it's, it, convexity is something funny because when I was a student in the 70s, uh, convexity had bad reputation because it was supposed to be a kind of easy way, I mean, to, a trick to solve uh, easy problems. And serious people were trying to set up methods for non-convex problems. But it turns out that convexity uh, has uh, came back very strongly in the, in the recent years. And of course, the convexity is very often hidden. So you have to find the convexity in your problem. But in many fields in pure mathematics or applied mathematics, actually, it turns out that it is very often a good idea to try to find a convex structure. And this is, uh, and of course, you can do convexity in very high dimension. is a very fancy part of functional analysis. So now it is uh, very respected. But I remember the time where it was not so respected, including by people like me, actually. Okay, so the, um, uh, uh, yes, so, yes, maybe I can skip this statement. So this is our two pictures. So usually you get the picture of Kantorovich when he was very old, but uh, actually it was, uh, uh, it, it is quite interesting that in many talks you show the picture of mathematicians when they are very old. And precisely, usually not at the time where they, they found the, the result. So I try to get, picture of the people when they were doing what they are known for. So for Euler, it's very difficult because there are very few pictures of Euler, actually. And not, I didn't see any picture of, uh, of Euler as a young person, actually. And so you, you have the kind of, uh, I don't know if it is like a uh, socialist realism, the pictures, but you see it was kind of a combination of classical and modern art. Okay, and uh, just to tell you, I don't want to leave you the idea that combinatorics is reduced to the linear assignment problem, which is very simple. This will be an offense for people in combinatorics. So let me just show you a very, very slightly different problem in combinatorics, where you are given two, uh, two, uh, two uh, matrices, lambda and C, and this is called the quadratic assignment problem because it's quadratic with respect to these two cost matrices. And so it looks almost the same. So you are just trying to find an optimal permutation and uh, to minimize that. This turned out to be an NP problem. So it's a hard combinatorial optimization problem. And as far as I remember, this includes the traveling salesman problem. So it's a hard combinatorial problem. So you see, with very little change, I can move from an easy one to another different one. However, I found out quite recently that if you look at this problem in a, in a continuous limit, actually this, is, uh, this can be related, at least for specific choice of lambda and C, and C, still to the Euler equation, but to the seeking of, 
uh, stationary solution of the Euler equation in three dimension, actually you get a problem that can be discretized as this one. This is quadratic assignment problem. So in some sense, the richness of all our equation is not emptied by the rather simple linear assignment problem, uh, which, by the way, is polynomial, like n cube operation. But you can do also that. Euler uh, uh, equation is really linked to hard combinatorial optimization problems. OK, so. Uh, now, this is a good time to do a little bit of propagation. It's time to finish. But then to, fin to say that the, the pro the, this uh, quite stupid linear assignment problem actually is, turns out to be extremely uh, important in many fields of applied and pure maths. And this is the, now known as the optimal uh, transportation problem, OK? And which goes back to uh, work done by Gaspard Monge uh, in 1780, so shortly after Euler. And I don't think it's as deep as Euler by, by, by far. And it turns out that this problem uh, in the, well, has been known for a long while, but the interaction with PDEs, uh, which I was part of it, turned out to be extremely successful and there are connection with almost everything, you know. Every year there is some kind of new application. So it started with, uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, uh, connection with functional analysis and uh, Riemannian geometry and uh, more practical application like image processing and uh, as Stan said, uh, reconstruction of the early universe, which is very important for our daily life. And I just add yesterday machine learning, of course. And this is true, actually. The people in machine learning, they are very much interested in this kind of idea. And, uh, but you have the problem of dimensionality. So the optimal transportation problem seems to be uh, useless in machine learning. But we know that they are attached to the hamilton jacobi equation. And uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, this is, again, the propaganda for, for UCLA. And then, therefore, these ideas of solving the hamilton jacobi equation in, in large dimension is uh, emerging. So probably this is uh, the, the, and I know also some people in France who are really doing uh, optimal transport in a large dimension for image. I mean, you just, and they have results, and they, this is basically based on the fact that you have to use stochastic gradient. So there are also in, in, in Paris some people doing these kind of things. OK, so to finish, so this is a, a nice uh, picture of uh, Gaspard Monge. Also, you can get very many ugly pictures of Monge. Because at that time, there was no photograph. So I mean, it was very easy for the painter to make a very nice picture of you. OK? And uh, this is uh, the, I, I think, uh, Optimal Transport was very grateful for, to Cédric Villani to write, in some sense, one uh, a very readable textbook at, uh, now it's about 15 years ago, which was very influential and helped very much the propagation of uh, optimal transport in many fields. And this is my final picture. So this is like a, a kind of evolution of uh, artistic taste. You know, so, uh, so, and of course, in the middle, you have the, the super classical French tie, you know. And which is probably unrelated to the, to the, real, to the reality, which is very typically a kind of French attitude, right? So the, and by this, I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Assuming the, the, the optimal cost to, um, to reverse the, the thing. Yeah, so maybe. Yeah, no, but this is related. So this picture actually is related to the work of, uh, of Balint Virag. And actually, uh, I was giving a similar talk in front of uh, a colleague of us, I mean, Gérard Benarus, who from New York, uh, from Crohn's Institute. And he told me, oh, yeah, but you know, this picture, I saw it in the paper of uh, Virag. But it seemed that in the uh, Balint Virag, because they were trying to see what is the large deviation theory for this algorithm where you flip uh, neighbors randomly. 
and what is the, um, the large deviation to get to this uh, reverse map? Because it's a very unlikely event. And therefore, they, they found, uh, they could prove, in some sense, it's, it's partly heuristical. They could prove that the optimal solution is exactly the one I drawn. But the, it seems that they are completely ignoring that this has any connection with fluid mechanics. OK, so I, I, I wrote to him recently to, to warn him that actually even this solution was known for a while in the context of fluid mechanics. But of course, his result is, uh, is new in the sense that this is a stochastic result. And OK, okay so let me do a kind of conjecture uh, that in some sense you could see that the whole equation is just the, if you use the jargon of large deviation theory, the good rate function, I mean the, the Lagrangian of, uh, of Euler equation is a good rate function for this game where you have a cube and you just flip randomly the, the neighboring cubes. Which is very beautiful actually. But it is, okay, I have, uh, yeah, so I, I guess that maybe this could be proved uh, in, uh, in a general uh, framework. And I think the work of, of uh, Virag is, and his student, actually, there, is, there are several people, is to, uh, is like a first step to the understanding of this large deviation principle, which I think would be ultimately the, one of the nicest possible of definitions of the incompressible Euler equation. So it is just this, uh, uh, the large the, the equation of the large deviation of this game of just uh, flipping, I mean, neighbors, which is simpler than the Rubik's Cube in some sense. What was the reference that he had seen the same Sorry? You said it really quickly. What was the reference that you had seen the reference? Oh, yeah. So you, uh, yeah, you, uh, actually, I think uh, you look at the recent preprint of uh, uh, Virag, is VI. R A G, and you will see this. Uh, yeah, you have exactly the same solution. So they do that only for this final permutation. But of course, by um, you know, it, since I am more in the deterministic side, so I worked out the problem of minimizing geodesics for the Euler equation, and this has been completely understood now. It is uh, there is there was also uh, some kind of improvement by Ambrosio and Figali in 2003. But we have a, a complete theory at the deterministic level. So what is missing is the, the stochastic analysis to get the large deviation principle. That's, that's, that's a missing point. But we have some hope that uh, this will be done in the future. This is, I think this is a conjecture. So I, th I think I probably, uh, I will give you, uh, if you solve it, maybe, what can I cook? What can I give to you? Yes, uh, coffee, a coffee at Kirchhoff, something like that. <laughs> All right, so let's thank Yannick again for the beautiful